Hello, hello, and welcome again, everyone, to a very important session at NestGen 23 this year. I'm Vishali, Markom Manager at Flightbase, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this session. Again, let us know how are you finding the sessions. We have a NestGen Wall of Love tab, so it will be great if you could share some feedback with us. It will definitely help us curate these sessions better in the upcoming editions. At this session, we are going to deep dive into the need for a robust connectivity infrastructure as the industry transitions towards auto automated BVLS operations. One of the most important consideration that goes without saying is, of course, safety. There have never been a greater need for a reliable and always on communication solution that provides robust performance, flexible data transmission and high levels of safety and security. To go into greater detail, we have a very special guest who will share how they have made it possible to de de deliver extremely reliable, high bandwidth, real-time connectivity, even in the most difficult and remote areas. So let's welcome Yoav Amitai, CEO of Elsight. Growing from within Elsight, Yoav was the Chief Innovation and Product Officer and CEO prior to becoming Elsight's CEO. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering in, from Israel's Ben Gurion University and has a rich resume that includes serving as a general manager of Agor Engineering. You have played a major part in initiating and executing Elsight's strategic transition from a project based to a product oriented company, leveraging its advanced technology and shaping its technology, technological and business vision. But before I let you off, share the L-side promise of real-time connectivity, real-time cooperation, and real-time results, I'd like to share a few housekeeping rules. Please type in your questions in the Q&A tab of the session, and we will get, that, get them answered at the end of the presentation. The session is getting recorded, and we will publish it online for viewing soon. We also have an l site booth in the expo section. So uh, for the next uh, ex uh, virtual booth session, please make sure that you visit it. And finally, remember to capture your favorite moments of the session and share it on Twitter and LinkedIn by using hashtag NestGen23, tag Flightbase. A few lucky of people might have a surprise in store. Uh, we also have a poll ongoing during the session, so I request everyone of you to participate. Uh, with that, over to you, Yov. But again, I, I, I would like to mention a, a, a huge shout out to our uh, title sponsor, DJ Enterprise, and platinum sponsor, Volatus Aerospace. Yes, again, with that, over to you, Yov. Thank you very much, Baisali. Thank you for having me and for the, giving the opportunity to speak with the audience about some of the challenges of having a BV loss or scalable BV loss operation and what is going through and all the lessons learned we had in LSI for the last four years that we are in this business of BV loss operation or connectivity for BV loss operation. Starting a little bit with LSI um, history and who is LSI. So like Blaise Ali introduced me, I am LSI CEO. Um, the company was founded in 2009. Since then, we're doing reliable communication solution for various applications. We started our roots in the Holland security and defense industry. And somewhere in 2019, like um, like Sally said, we are shifted from a project-based company to a product-based company. And we saw that having our technology or having a need, a critical need for reliable communication in the unmanned world is something that caught our eyes and we understand that there is a big vacuum there or a big challenge that that can be solved by our, by our technology and we started to develop our product specifically for this purpose or this sector in 2020 we launched our product which called the halo um, since then we started to work with different type of customers from platform manufacturers drone service providers um, and end users of drones that need reliable communication for their drones operation um, today, we have more than 80 different um, customers worldwide in every geos worldwide uh, with any kind of platforms, literally any kind of them, both um, aerial vehicle and ground vehicle. Today, we will focus more on the aerial uh, part of it. Um, over, the, over those two years since we launched the product or two and a half years, we accumulated um, hundreds of thousands of flight hours. So 
we pretty much have the vast experience or the, the biggest experience working in BVLOS um, in general and specifically about how critical is the need for reliable communication in this industry. And because of accumulating a lot of experience uh, working on different places, different environments, different applications, use cases, platforms, um, today I'm here to share with you our knowledge and what all the lesson learned we have from all this experience. And I hope you'll find it valuable for your application or for your um, scale of your business, of your Bivilos business. So starting a little bit about Bivilos and what is the path for Bivilos and where we are today as far as we see it in LSAID. So we started um, starting our engine as an industry. We are doing a lot of um, testing. Part of it was a little bit hobbyist. We started to transit into more of a professional applications or professional work that was done. Um, started to take the operator um, outside of the loop, so try to have a sc more scalable businesses. Um, and doing a lot of testing under different conditions, under different safety measures. Again, like Vaisali said in the beginning, um, to have to make sure that we have the, the highest safety measures or the highest safety standards that we can have as an industry. From there, we are in the way in the phase that we're currently at, um, doing a more of extended range BVLOS operation under different deployment and different stuff that we're doing, different kind of application. Um, started to do semi-autonomously semi that will help scale this business. We'll talk about it um, later in the in, in my presentation, why it's so uh, important to have these autonomous uh, capabilities and why the human factor is actually what currently set us back when we're talking about the drone ecosystem in general um, and how to start to work with not only single drones or single platforms, but working with fleets of drones again for the sake of scale this business and make it much more economical and make the business case much more viable. And looking to the future, we'll get to the place that we are working on literally unlimited, unlimited range, can operate a drone from anywhere to anywhere, can operate a fleet of drone, um, can make it fully autonomously in a um, commercial level. So it will enable, like I said, a lot of new business case that today we are probably not even thinking about and will make it much more interesting for us as an industry to, to find more and more application that can be done with this, great, with this great technology. And by that, growing this business or growing our ecosystem by providing more and more services. Um, the reason it's, it's so important to have all those measures together is first of all, because as we see it in LSI, as an industry today, we have a role to um, pitch the technology to the entire world and show how big of a change that can drive in the way we commute, in the way we're getting our deliveries, in the way we're doing the security inspection, agriculture, literally can change any factor of our lives as a human being in this earth um, and make it um, much more um, productive, much more economical and much cleaner. Um, and those are the interesting factors about it. When we're talking about BVLOS, sir, there is, I want to start with what BVLOS is. So we can start from VLOS, EVLOS, and BVLOS. VLOS stands for visual line of sight, extended visual line of sight, and beyond visual line of sight, which the actual um, term or the actual uh, definition for each one of those terms are different, are different between different geos or between different, different regulatory authorities. But let's say that line of sight is ranging anywhere for, from zero to 1.5, two kilometers, again, depend on the regulatory authority, but it's not necessarily meaning that you usually literally have line of sight. You can have line of sight, but in terms of regulatory, it can still uh, be considered as bivilos because of the range you have from you. Not only that, it can be very close to you, but you have a lot of obstacles like trees, buildings, um, different kind of interference or different kind of objects between you and the platform, which will also make it not a visual line of sight, but beyond visual line of sight. So one measure is the distance for, between the operator and the drone. But equally importantly, it's, all, it's not only that, it's also how many platform a single operator or a single pilot can operate. So for an example, if we have a single operator flying uh, three drones for agriculture uh, mission in 500 meters range, that's still considered as beyond visual line of sight. Not because it's literally beyond visual line of sight because According to most of the regulatory authorities worldwide, if it's one operator operating more than one platform, that's considered BVLOS. 
And that's had a lot of implication in terms of certification, safety measures, regulatory processes that the operator and the operation need to go through. Um, but that's the idea of what BVLOS is and what separate between BVLOS, um, extended visual line of sight and visual line of sight, which each one of them require different kind of um, requirements by the regulatory authorities worldwide. Speaking a little bit about the challenges of BVLOS, and I'm putting aside all the, let's call it the regulatory burdens and everything that is happening there because we are today in this presentation, in my presentation today, we're going to focus on the um, technology side of it. And BVLOS have three main um, challenges when we're talking about technology, technological challenges. First is the air, aerospace management. So think about an environment that have multiple operators who are operating in the same airspace um, need to communicate some, somehow between them, making sure that there are no conflict or no, um, they are not hitting each other. And not only that, we can also have manned and unmanned um, vehicles in the same airspace and everything needs to be managed in one space. And there are a lot of sessions today in, in NestGen today that are about this airspace management, but that's a very big challenge when we're talking about BBLOS and not a single operator operating a single drone again. The second one is the autonomy. When we're talking about BVLOS at scale, and that's my own belief and else I believe in general is that to make this industry, to take this industry into its full potential of having or seeing hundreds of thousands of drones flying around doing different types of missions, that must have go through taking the human factor outside of the loop. And the reason being is for three main reasons. First of all is because of the business, business case. So when we're talking about labor, that's the one of the highest costs when we're talking about um, drone operation in general. And taking the human factor will reduce dramatically this labor cost because it will allow single operator to operate a fleet of drone again, and that will make it much more economical. The second one is safety, is about safety. In the end of the day, we are human beings. We're all humans. We're all doing mistakes. Unlike software that is doing whatever it's designed to be doing, so putting aside bugs. Um, but if we have all the safety measures when we are developing the softwares that will run this autonomous, um, that will make it much safer um, and will make it, um, again, much more, in, in terms of safety measure, will make it much more reliable to use as a system. And the third one is about productivity. Um, again, we are all human beings and we all have our, um, our kind of glass ceiling that we cannot cross. And if we're talking about software that can manage tens of drones or more than that in a very productive way. And again, by doing that, helping to do it in a better scale, in a higher scale and more use cases and more application, um, that can be very interesting. And last but not least is the connectivity. When we're talking about BVLOS challenges, so think about platforms that are travel around, either control platforms or autonomous platforms, they're all travel around, need to be monitored need to be controlled, need to be censored. If we're talking about real-time sensing for different type of application like security, for example, or some, in some inspection ward or agriculture that require real-time communication between the platform and the operator or the pilot, uh, connectivity become a very big challenge or a very big, a very um, inherent um, part of the BVLOS operation, the BVLOS challenge. And that's what I want to focus my um, my presentation today will be around the connectivity part of it. And I want to start with list the different alternatives of different types of connectivity solution that are today available in the market. Again, and we're talking about BVLOS solutions. We're talking about way to scale BVLOS operation, and that's what I'm going to, to go through um, in the next few minutes. So starting with a standard point-to-point -point proprietary RF, mostly in unlicensed um, frequencies, um, that is between a single pilot to a single um, drone. Even if we're talking about mesh network, it still have its own limitation, which makes it pretty much not relevant for BVLOS because of the limit of the range that it can fly, because of a lot of inter interference that is happening around the areas. Most of those systems working on 2.4 or 5.8 um, gigahertz, which <clears throat> makes a lot of interference with different type of wireless um, devices that are working in the area. Um, if we're talking about swap, size, weight, and power consumption ratio, um, so the size 
and the, the size and weight is really good, but the power consumption is fairly high if you um, compare it to other, other type of solutions. And it's also create a local network. So in the end of the day, you have a good network between you and the drone, as long as it's within the coverage area, but you can't do anything that it's above that. So if you want to have additional application that are running in the cloud or have another um, factor in the loop, you want to be able to edit in because you have a closed network in the end of the day, and that's create a lot of um, limitation for how you can use those um, those specific mission or what you can do in, in specific mission. So, and point-to-point -point RF solution might be good in some cases only for landing or takeoff, but it's definitely not relevant for beyond visual line of sight application. We're talking about long range or not only long range, but also cloud connected solutions that are really relevant for, for, for our industry, for the drone industry. The second alternative is satellite communication, which in satellite, there are three different categories. There are only keep alive, which is just few message every few minutes, just to know that the drone is operating and what is the status of it. The second is a full C2, full con con command and control and telemetry link. And the third one is video transmission in a low quality, or let's call it a payload transmission in a low quality. And the reason we are uh, we have this list of different categories is because, first of all, the bandwidth of the satellite is very limited or very expensive or both. So it's also, if we're talking about real-time application that require a lot of backhauling of data or streaming of data to the command center or the command and control center, uh, makes the satellite very, um, very expensive and very, it's, it's not a good fit for this industry because of latency and bandwidth and everything. On the other side, you have a good coverage, so you'll have satellite anywhere. Um, so having maybe having some kind of a combination between satellite and other infrastructure, that can be interesting. But if we're looking on the satellite only, um, that will be very hard to, to show um, uh, how it's viably economical for, for the use cases of our industry. And if I'm looking on the swap of today's um, solutions that are available in the market, so most of them are either very big in size or size, so require a lot of real estate on the drone, and they are very heavy, ranging from, I don't know, 1.5, 2 kilograms to more than that. And I'm talking about those that can stream um, also the payload and not only the C2 and telemetry, uh, which again makes it not really relevant for Bivolos because of the price and because of the swap and all the, the, other, um, the other parameters that you see on the screen here. And from our experience working, like I said, on hundreds of thousands of flight hours in Bivolos, we see that working over public cellular infrastructure, mostly LTE and 5G, but not only that can go to 3G and 2G as well, that's the most economical way and most productive way to use in those systems for many different reasons. First of all, you can support um, Swarm on different topology, which is one-to-many or one-to-one, -one, and you can play with it. So the infrastructure allow you to be very flexible with what you can do. Um, second, it doesn't rely on line of sight or any ground control station, and there is no limitation for range. Again, we're talking about unlimited range, basically. It can work between different countries, different continents, and still have a good quality of service in terms of latency and bandwidth you can get from the from this infrastructure. It's extremely widespread infrastructure. If we're talking about the solar infrastructure, mostly in, um, in urban areas or populated areas, um, today, according to different analyses, uh, something between 85 to 92 percent of the world um, is covered by cellular infrastructure. So it's extremely widespread, uh, which makes it very easy to rely on this network uh, to start to do BVLOS application to go basically from anywhere to, to anywhere. Um, it's, it works um, on the Internet infrastructure, so it can be limited for the access it will have for the world for safety measure or cyber measures. But on the other side, it allows you to, to work with a lot of um, software as a service application that are running in the cloud and have a real time streaming from the platform, from the field, both the operator and the drone to the cloud. And from there doing a lot of data analysis and a lot of um, data manipulation, let's call it, which again, will use the same operation, <clears throat> sorry, um, to multiple kind of application with the same flight, um, which makes it very interesting. And if we're talking about, again, again, going back to the swap ratio, to the size, weight, and power consumption ratio, in the end of the day, those modules or this infrastructure is by design 
um, engineer to be working on a battery uh, devices. So it makes it very um, power, a very low power consumption, and also the real estate and the way that it adds to the to the drone is very limited. And because of that, it makes it very interesting to use this kind of infrastructure um, for people's application. <clears throat> now, I want to go a little deeper into the cellular infrastructure and how exactly cellular infrastructure is work and what are the limitations or what are the challenges of working on public infrastructure. First of all, if we're looking on this infrastructure and that's, um, that chart is coming from Ericsson, you will see that in the end of the day, those cells, the, those um, cellular antennas are optimized to be on the level of the average handset, which is obviously on the terrestrial level on the ground. That's where most of the subscribers are. That's where they are like, um, both having their antennas um, directed. And also that's where they have most of the operators, they have the license to use those frequencies on a terrestrial level and not on a high altitude level which is make it, it makes it a little, little bit of a challenge for us as a drone economy because the infrastructure is not optimized to work in heights. It's optimized to work on terrestrial level. <clears throat> and if I'll add another, uh, another nice chart, that one is called from Qualcomm, which shows that basically what happened if you're working with drones, you are working on the side lobes of the antenna and not on the core of the antenna because of the uh, because of how how the radio frequencies are spread from the antenna outside. Now think about that, that if you are here right above the cell, so not necessarily you need to fly high, but you need to have just a little bit higher from the cell tower um, height, you'll have almost zero communication, which makes it into a, um, a very big challenge because um, in the end of the day, you want to be connected all the time and you want to have a reliable communication. <clears throat> Before I'm jumping into how to solve those challenges, um, that's an interesting analysis that was done by Verizon and the FAA in the US um, for airborne LTE operation, they call it ALO, um, which shows very good that um, the initial findings indicates uh, that the cellular network can sufficiently support um, uh, um, unmanned uh, aerial systems. Um, CNPC stands for uh, control and non-payload communication below 500 feet, which again, it shows that the infrastructure is designed or can work on those heights, but you'll still have those blind spots that you don't have network. Now, thinking about this challenge and how that can be solved, that's a very challenging area. And that's where solutions like l site like ours comes into play. Basically what we're doing, we're combining multiple cell at the same time. So we're combining multiple um, carriers or multiple SIM at the same time which bring us a very good advantage of working uh, both when we are hopping between different cells, but also when we help always or constantly have a communication, not only not with only one carrier, but with multiple carriers. And by that, we have multiple advantages. First of all, we're not exposed to this challenge that I just shared with you about how the frequencies are spread and having uh, or being affected by the side lobes of the antennas, because we're working with multiple cells at the cell at the same time. So we have statistically, we have a much better coverage if we're looking across the board. Not only that, even if we're talking about bandwidth, bandwidth as an example. So what we're actually doing is we are connecting multiple carriers together into big pipe of bandwidth or big pipeline of data. So not only you can utilize what you get from a single operator, you can utilize what you get from multiple operators at the same time and that provide you a better bandwidth or a better data pipeline to, the, to push more data through this pipeline, whether it will go to the operator or it will go to the cloud for real-time analysis, that's what will happen. In terms of reliability and connectivity, it will provide you with much higher reliable communication. We call it connection confidence because like I said before, we're connecting multiple networks at the same time. And if in, even if one of them goes down or have any problem of, um, antenna um, coverage or any malfunction of the network or anything like that, we are constantly connected with all of them concurrently to be able to, again, optimize the reliability and to provide the necessary um, reliability of the network that will provide the safety measures that you will need for your BVLOS application. Um, when, if we're looking from the regulatory authorities standpoint, so in the end of the day, they want to show safety. They want to see that you have all the safety measures, all the redundancy 
measures built into your platform, into your operation uh, or concept of operation. And that's exactly what the Halo does. It's provide you with very high level of redundancy while keeping a very reliable link between the operator and um, the platform that are spread in the field. And another interesting factor of it is that we're creating a full infrastructure that enables um, scalable mission, basically, or scalable deployments based on our infrastructure, which again, makes it very interesting this um, um, use case for, for specifically for drones in Bivilos uh, operation. And that's what we're doing um, in LSI. The reason I went through all the different alternatives and try to stretch for you all the different alternatives, because in the end of the day, it's something that every platform manufacturers or only service provider need to have those kind of thinking about what will be the best solution for your application, whatever the application will be, and who will be the best partner to work with. Um, in my uh, private opinion, I think that you want to find um, the vendors or the partners that have the experience of working on many different um, scenarios, many, many different platforms that will enable you the full flexibility to work with your network and will give you a lot of um, benefit, not only because of the product you're getting, but also from the experience that was accumulated over the time and can think together with you, what are the challenges or what are the problems that we are still don't know? Because all of us have some area that we don't know what, what we don't know. And with the experience we accumulated over the time, um, today I'm feeling that we have a lot of uh, lesson learned to share with the industry and a lot of um, insight that we can share with different kind of platform manufacturers and service providers, again, to help them scale their business. Um, to finish with some small, one of our partners, um, one of the most closer partners that we're working with is drawn up in the US. Um, and there is a short video just showing how important the communication is for their operation or for operation in general and how they um, incorporate the Halo into their business. Um, so that just um, 30 seconds video and we'll go back to the uh, presentation. This little device here has proven to be one of the most important aspects of everything that we incorporate into our drone. Um, reliable connectivity is uh, not something you should take for granted. And LSight and, and this Halo solution has provided an opportunity for us to um, not have to worry about it. It fades away to the background. Once it's set up, it runs, it makes a connection. And um, and we're really pleased with the not only the performance that we get, but also out of the partnership with LSAT as well. Um, I couldn't recommend this device more for anybody that's interested in actually gaining uh, reliable connectivity for their drones. So um, I, I want to finish with, like, like I said before, in the end of the day, communication is a vital part in your Bivilos um, operation in general, and you need to put a lot of thinking about what will be the right solution for your operation or for your application. And you don't necessarily say that our solution will be the best, but uh, I can assure you that we have a very good experience of helping others and understanding what is the best way to scale to Bifilos. And in my own opinion, like I said before, the only way for the, for our industry to scale into its full potential, and I think that potential is literally unlimited, is going through Bivilos application, taking the human factor outside of the loop and make it with the highest safety measure, which those are the three main factors that will enable all of us to, to scale our ecosystem and to go to the next phase. So, um, Baisali, thank you very much for, uh, for the time, and I'll be more than happy to answer any question. Yes, uh, thank you, Yoav, again for your for sharing these insights. This was definitely like a short crash course to how to get started or jump start with BVLS operations. We have a lot of questions in the Q and A, so I'm going to start with them. So there's a common question which has come up a couple of times. That is, what is the operational impact of losing connection for a brief time? Like, if there is a, a, a what about the uptime? And uh, does people always have to go for a multi-SIM solution, which will be costlier? So um, there are two, two or three questions into this one question. First of all, about what are the requirements for the regulatory body? So it really depends on the location, on where it is. Different regulatory authorities have different definition. But in general, most of them doesn't care if the, um, if the mission will be completed. They care about safety. So if you're losing communication for a given threshold of time and that threshold change between places, you either need to go back home 
or to hover until you have communication back, but you certainly cannot continue your mission. That's why having a constant communication is so critical, even if you're looking on the last um, Bivilos arc um, that was released by the FAA committee around what is required, a C2 link, it's a must have to be able to complete Bivilos operation. Um, so that's to answer one of your one of the questions. The second question about the price, it's not necessarily most more costly to use multiple SIM cards because what solution like ours are doing is we're optimizing the network in a way that you will use only what you need to have the reliable communication that is required on one hand. On the other hand, we'll give you the required quality of service to deliver the data that you want to deliver from the platform, from the drone to the other side. Um, so it's not necessarily will be more costly. It's more about optimization of the cost and how to do it properly. Um, so that's that's to answer both questions. Right. Uh, and follow up question to that here is that how using multi-SIM solution will solve high altitude communication? Uh, do you have like 4G, 5G? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. Because of what I shared about how the spread of the RF frequencies are look at when you are going into higher altitude and high altitude, I'm not talking about thousands of, uh, of feet um, in the air because there you don't have any network. We're talking about hundreds of feet on the average where most of the drones are flying, let's say between 100 and 400 meters, uh, which you still, sorry, have a network coverage. In those places, if you have multiple SIM cards or multiple modems, it's not only multiple SIM cards, but multiple connections, um, statistically you have better coverage because if one cell is covering this area and another cell have some overlap with it, being connected for both cells or four cells at the same time concurrently, that's what will provide you with the reliability that is required to, to complete your mission. So um, it certainly gives you a better chance or a better reliable chance uh, to complete your mission. Right. Um, so we have, a. am just going through the question. I'm just figuring out. So what are the key challenges of establishing a reliable connectivity infrastructure for BVLS operations in remote areas, if you would like to answer that. Yeah, so the, the challenge with remote areas is that um, if there is no infrastructure there, there is a big capex investment that needs to be done to be able to provide the necessary infrastructure. So in those places, we either have private networks that can be worked, or we can either move to satellite between satellite and cellular, and it's part of what system like ours are doing again to use the satellite only when it's really required otherwise it will be very costly um, but at the end of the day it's important to say that we are we are always saying that we are not magicians if we're if it's in a place that there is um, in the middle of nowhere under the under the earth it will be very hard to, to create a communication there but even if you have only fractions of network that will be enough for us um, to deliver the required bandwidth that you need for your application, for sure for the C2 and the telemetry, and in most cases also for the uh, for the payload communication. Right. Uh, I think we have a lot of follow-up questions to that. So do you also support 2G, 3G? Because most remote areas do not have LTE or 5G because of the short range. Yeah, absolutely. Our Specifically, our device support um, all the way from 5G to 3G. Uh, on TG networks, obviously the network will be um, weaker, but it's still in many remote areas, we see that the 2G um, is very, uh, that's the infrastructure that is available. And that's enough to deliver again, the C2 and the telemetry link. In some places, it's also enough to deliver video. Um, specifically our device, yes, can work all the way from 5G, LTE, 3G and 2G. Uh, we support all different kinds of technologies and bands. Right. Uh, I think I think that clears a lot of questions. Uh, so moving on, do you know about any or do you have any tools uh, where, where you can understand uh, the cellular coverage prior to getting started with an operation? Yeah, great questions. Um, part of what we develop over the years, understanding exactly this question and how big is the challenge of trying to have kind of a SORA analysis of let's include the network coverage. Part of the tools that we develop over the years is to be able to capture the, the data while the drone is flying to capture the data and to build kind of a coverage map in a given area. 
and to have a very good analysis around it. So in the next flight or the following flight or sometime with, when someone will fly there, we'll have the data to support what is the coverage in a given area. And we're doing it in every single flight is basically um, collecting this data and building a map of coverage, which is a, a very big challenge because most of the coverage map are on the terrestrial level and are 2D maps. Because we're talking about the third dimension, which is the altitude, that makes it more challenging and it will, it's much harder to find reliable data that supports what is the coverage on different altitudes. So we are building it as we as we accumulating more and more flight hours, and it's part of what exposed for our customers being able to do those recordings and to use the recorder data uh, to have better analysis of their flight routes. Right. I think that answers the question. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. One is definitely on the L site solution price. So if you would like to answer that, your yeah, by the price, um, I would say I wouldn't mention a specific price because it will be not fair because we have different kind of flavor to the product and different types of uh, business model. I would say that in terms of order of magnitude, we are sitting in the middle range of the pricing from uh, if you compare it to different type of solutions in the market. Um, part of what's interesting in our business model is what we have. We call it Halo as a service. Which we try, what we try to do is to align our business model with our partner's business model. So most of the drone service provider are working on, based on mission completion. And we wanted to align our business model to their business model. So what we're doing, we have a very low um, CapEx investment again for the hardware, for the actual Halo device. And then over the time, once this specific drone starting to generate revenue, then only then you are start to pay for L site for this service, basically, uh, which makes it very interesting. Again, we're constantly thinking as a company, what else we can do to help this industry scale and to help our partners scale. Uh, and that's part of what we come up with, not only on the technology side, but also on the business side and how we can help this industry to get to its full potential. Um, and for a drone service provider, that makes it a very interesting business model that we see a very good traction of this new model that we just um, launched end of 22. Right. Thanks again, uh, you are for addressing that uh, because you spoke about partnerships. So I have a question which we are actually asking to all our speakers. Uh, could you please share some of thoughts on the open DIB approach, which we uh, kind of set the theme for NestGen this year, where each company contributes to a different layer of the drone autonomy stack? What are its benefits and how can it help us grow as an industry? So it very much speaks to what I mentioned before. As I see it, in the end of the day, the drone industry for sure have a business case. I mean, if you'll ask me five years ago, many people would say it's a technology that's looking for a problem. I think today that we're seeing some of our partners and different, um, different companies in the ecosystem are doing massive deployments, have a very interesting business case, have a very um, effective monetization vehicle that they are using. It's there already, but it's still going through a lot of hassles and all, a lot of pushbacks that we will go through as, a, as an industry. And I think it's exactly what you asked. That's what is required to go through this chasm, let's call it, is being able to collaborate together uh, to, to work as an open environment, either, either if we're talking on competition or partners, we all need to look on the same direction of how to make this industry get to its full potential because I, I think that it's literally unlimited uh, what it can get to. And the reference that I usually like to give to people when I'm thinking, talking about it, it's think about what happened less than 120 or a little more than 120 years ago on the automotive industry when vehicle just started to drive the street. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this rule uh, by Zali, but there was the red flag rule, which said that every automotive vehicle that have internal combustion engine have to have someone that is walking in front of the vehicle waving with a red flag which doesn't make any sense, right? But that's exactly the human factor in, in the loop that I mentioned before. Once we will release it, and once we as an industry will have all the right safety measures and all the right collaboration between us to get this industry to its full potential, we're all going to benefit from that. And I don't think it will be one winner takes it all. It will be a lot of companies that will be able to thrive in this environment and 
that's what we're doing in LSI, trying to collaborate and to partner with any companies we think that um, can help us and they'll help the industry to, to get there. Right. Thank you for sharing that, Yoav. I think uh, if I had to draw an an analogy, today uh, visual observers are the person who's moving with the red flag uh, kind of a scenario that we are seeing in the drone industry today. So I I think uh, we've covered most of the questions. There's one final question, and I think this is still why you shared a present uh, slide on this, but there's still a question that lingers in people's mind. That is, uh, to differentiate between VLOS and BVLOS, is it just by pure eyesight or there is more to it? No, it's much more to that. Like I mentioned, first of all, there is how many different platforms a single operator is operating. So it can be on 100 meters or less than 100 meters range. But if it's a single operator operating multiple platforms, that's considered BVLOS already. doesn't matter what the distance is. That's one. Second, uh, it's not only about if you literally see in visual line of sight or not see, it's about what is the actual distance, ground distance between you and the platform. So, and that's the, and that change between different uh, regulatory authorities worldwide. But in a very basic, I would say that um, visual line of sight is considered up to two or three kilometers. Anything beyond that is already either extended line of sight or beyond visual line of sight. Uh, which have different kind of requirement by the regulatory authorities again. Um, but it's not only about distance, it's also about how do you operate the drone and how many drones you're operating as a single operator. Right. Uh, thank you again, Yov. I think we've end, uh, close to the uh, end of the session. So would you like to share any closing thoughts for the audience? Um, the only thing I would like to share again is, like I said before, I think that this industry in general have huge potential. It's on all of us shoulders uh, to be able to push it forward. And I think what you guys in Flybase are doing with this event is absolutely amazing. And a big shout out for you for arranging it. That's exactly what we need to do as an industry and how we need to push forward. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, And thank you for the audience for uh, participating, for the participation. Thank you again, you all, for the kind words. And to everybody joining us today, thank you uh, again for spending this time with us. I'm sure you found some valuable insights at the session. So if you like the session, do drop us a LinkedIn post uh, by tagging ne- hashtag NestGen23 and OpenDIB movement. And uh, we have three <coughs> sessions coming up uh, right uh, next. So please head over to the sessions tab to check out the upcoming three sessions. You all have a great day out there, and thank you for supporting us at NestGen. Thank you, Yov, again uh, for joining us today and spending this time with us. Thank you, by Sally, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, if anyone wants our team to, to approach you, there is a poll there. Just answer yes, and we'll um, touch base. Um, it will be great to do it. Yes, I think we've got 10 votes out there. so. Um, uh, Thank you again. Uh, We will pass it on to Yoav and uh, they'll get in touch with you shortly. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.